Okay. So um, uh, Edna will lead the motivation and sing her preferred verse. The verse is verse 36. Um, I'll read it in English and then in Hebrew. And some words by uh, Ken McLeod. So the verse is that. In brief, whatever you are doing, ask yourself, what's the state of my mind? With constant mindfulness and mental alertness, accomplish others good. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. In Hebrew, בקצרה, להיות מודע ודרוך באשר תהיה ותעשה, לבחון את מצב תודעתך ולשאוף תמיד לטובת הזולת. זהו התרגול של ילדי הבודה. So from the book uh, by Ken McLeod, Reflections on Silver River, I will add that thinking of this verse, um, allows us to reflect on how important it is to have the attention and awareness needed. The way to reduce the, dis the, distort the, the distorting effects of patterns is to bring as much attention as possible to what you're experiencing. Thus, whatever you are doing, question what is arising in your mind. In that awareness, knowing arises. Knowing arises from meeting, opening, understanding, and accepting what is arising in your life. That is how you bring about what helps others. You respond to the need of each moment, to the imbalances and pains of the world. So thinking of awareness and attention, and in Hebrew, the beautiful term of simatlev or tesumatlev, putting your heart in the world. Hello, I am live from Karina's kitchen. <laughs> My um, internet went down, so anyway, I had to go across town. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it's it's an interesting time right now. It feels very um, I don't know chaotic, volatile, pressure cooker. You know, I um, I was watching the news yesterday and reading the news and feeling, you know, the sadness of the politics of my country, sadness of the politics of your country, general, oh my God, <laughs> sort of feeling. And um, then I read the Heart Sutra and then I thought possibly all of these <laughs> mistakes would be settled if we all just kept reading the Heart Sutra and kept reading the Heart Sutra and kept reading the Heart Sutra. So, um, in particular today, we're going to look at the form is empty, emptiness is form passage, because what is prejudice if not grasping at form? 
So um, that's what we're going to do a bit of today. But first, we're going to look at the verses. <clears throat> so if you look on page five, um, we're up to verse 31. So, um, so we just finished the section on the six perfections specifically. We just finished with wisdom, which was uh, verse 30, that since the five perfections without wisdom cannot bring perfect enlightenment, along with skillful means cultivate the wisdom, which does not conceive the three spheres as real, this is the practice of bodhisattvas. So that's kind of the dividing line of um, kind of our conduct in daily life, as well as our inner conduct, as well as our inner framework and mentality to really connect with the perfections. And then it goes into a kind of a section on checking in with and naming potential points of hypocrisy, you know, and just kind of looking at all right, we love the six perfections, we want to embody the six perfections, and how are we inconsistent with what we cherish and what we actually do? And so it's just kind of a series of mirroring verses to ask yourself, you like this, but who are you actually? Are we as consistent as we say that we are? Um, is it enough to say, I like bodhicitta? or do we actually need to embody bodhicitta and um, just kind of these check-in verses. So um, verse 31 is, if you don't examine your own errors, you might look like a practitioner, but not act like one. Therefore, always examining your own errors, rid yourself of them. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So this is very straightforward, isn't it? It's just, if you don't look at your own stuff, um, you might present well, but be completely hypocritical. And if you live your whole life that way, then you'll never actually become a bodhisattva and the impact you'll have will be limited. So it's quite straightforward in terms of understanding. The, the question is, <clears throat> how do we recognize our errors without identifying with our errors? How do we take responsibility without attributing fault and blame? How do we be honest without being punishing, et cetera, et cetera? All of the themes that come up again and again that um, a brutally honest, piercing self-awareness can shine a light on your heart and bring it forefront as a relief. But the way we normally do it is like whipping ourselves. So when we see our own faults, we think, immediately identification. I am those faults. Yeah, that they are my fault, they are my responsibility, or they are in no way my fault, or in no way my responsibility. We don't usually see the accurate state of affairs of they are dependently arisen, and they are dependently arisen here. So they are my work, but I don't need to think they are me or mine, but they are my work. Yeah, so it's this, it's this delicate shift of bringing your faults very clear to the forefront of your mind, while at the same time not thinking they are you. Yeah. So again and again this comes up, but it's whenever we're looking at um, examining our own faults or errors or mistakes or whatever, um, if you're feeling a reactivity of, I don't know, defensiveness, of humiliation, of disassociation, et cetera, et cetera, all of that is showing that you're thinking of that examination as an examination of self, when in fact it's an examination of things that are extra and additional and not self. Yeah, so when you're feeling reactivity to looking at your stuff, it's because of over-identification with your stuff. Obvious, yes. Um, and yet, when we look at our own reactivity to certain verses, isn't the core of our reactivity a, an over-identification. Do you think? If you're thinking about the, the verses so far that were particularly challenging, what was it that made them challenging? You know, what makes us feel defeated? Or this is too hard, I can't possibly do this, I need to give up. Or this ideal is outrageous, human beings can never live up to it. Or what makes us kind of, you know, defeated or what are the ways of thinking that make us inspired and think, yes, this is possible for a human being. I'm not there yet, but by naming it, I'm moving towards it and how wonderful it is such a path exists. And then, you know, happy do to do going off on your path. So looking at your own responses to the verses so far, what are the things that create reactivity? 
we like to think of ourselves as, uh, as good and uh, moral and uh, perfect and everything that uh, is not uh, um, portraying this is, is uh, an injury. Yep. <laughs> It's sometimes it's that we think we're good enough and we kind of want an excuse not to progress because so far we're not too bad. <laughs> you know, you say, give me a break. I'm a nice person. Give me a break. I recycle. <laughs> I call my mother. I, I'm a good person, you know, and you give me a break. Why are you pushing me to be a Buddha? Why are you pushing me to be a Bodhisattva? Aren't I enough? You know, that, that can be the sort of thoughts that come up as well. And, um, you know, enough for what, enough for whom, what is this whole enough concept, unpack that a little bit, but also, um, do you really want to, um, I don't know, live with the same mistakes and suffering that we have right now? You know, is it, do you really want to just put up with the hardships of life or do you want to overcome them? You know, do you want to just accept that you can't help everyone or do you want to see if there are ways to help more? You know, these are the questions to ask ourselves and it becomes a little bit of a discussion with you yourself and laziness, you yourself and pride, um, all these kind of things. Yeah, but yeah, what else comes up though? You know, this kind of brutal self-honesty, it's only brutal if you're identified with it. Yeah, <clears throat> but it needs to be laser-like and precise of this I am doing okay, but I could do it better. And the fact that I'm not doing better doesn't mean I'm bad. Doesn't mean I'm deficient. It just means I haven't orchestrated the conditions for my own realizations. I need to empower myself to get back on the path. You know, I don't need to overthink it or get all messy about it. But examining reactivity to the verses is important. At first it seems so, uh so right that if I have some kind of rejection, it's a reactivity and identification. And then I thought it sounded to me like when you go to a psychologist, if you are in resistance, then you are your resistance to some some explanation or and and I thought that maybe some of the verses it's not just reactivity; it's something that educational that I found find more. Um, right, more wrong, uh, with all, um, it's not just the resistance, I assume it is, it's the ego or the self-cherishing, I understand it, but I want to feel that it's not just the resistance, it's really trying to understand what verse uh, I really believe in it, and what is more complicated, and just not just because of some reactivity or identification. Yeah, and maybe it's a, maybe there's a sequence, you know, maybe initial kind of resistance isn't necessarily a fully blown reactivity, rejection, I can't, I won't sort of thing. Maybe it's just a, I'm not sure if I'm on board with this or not. It needs a little bit more play internally. It needs a little bit more space and thought before I'm sure if I want to take this on board or not. And that's completely appropriate and, and useful and good. Um, but, you know, we have healthy doubt and then we have unhealthy doubt. And knowing the difference is so vital because then we can know that in response to any topic we come across anywhere in our life, Buddhism or otherwise, what is the difference between our healthy doubt that is moving towards truth, that is moving towards development, and what is our afflicted doubt that is just wanting things to be wrong so we don't have to change. You know, because, the, because it's not like doubt is in and of itself negative. Doubt is fine. It's just, is there an affliction tied together with it that's trying to look for an escape route from change? It seems to me that what I feel that the verses are so wonderful, but they're so far away that this gap is kind of depressing. I, thought, I, I remember we learned about this. I don't know if it's a sort of laziness or something else uh, yeah despondency 
Yeah, it was the, the laziness of despondency. Maybe this is for special people, but not for me. I'm only little, I'm only ordinary. This is for grown-up practitioners. <laughs> You know, this is for only for monks and nuns, or only for yogis in the cave, or only for people ethnically Tibetan, or only for, only for, only for, not me, I'm only little, you know. And it's a form of false humility, false modesty, that lets yourself off the hook from change because you're saying, oh, I'm just being humble. I just know where I am, you know, I can't do that yet. I just know myself, you know, when really that's BS, you can become a Buddha, you know. Um, but there's a, there's a lag time between understanding something and embodying it. There is, and that is a confronting lag time. Um, when you think, I love this, I want to live this, I want to embody this, and I absolutely can't today, I have too many afflictions, that's really confronting. That's a confronting self-knowledge, but it's only deflating if you think that that deficiency is yours and your fault and etc cetera, etc cetera. you know if you think all right in the terms of the world people would think i am a friendly nice person who is relatively healthy mentally and physically okay in the world i get to have that branding and i've been comfortable with that okay in terms of the spiritual path i am in my infancy and i've barely begun that's confronting because <laughs> this whole time I thought of myself as when in fact I'm actually, and you know, both of them are ways of landing too strongly on identity. If there were anywhere to land on identity, it would be your Buddha nature. Cause that's been with you the whole time. You know, your current afflictions, your current abilities, your current personality, your current ethnicity, your current whatever, is quite new in terms of the beginningless time of your mental continuity. You know, what's been with you the whole time is your Buddha nature. So identify with that. You know, that makes sense. Then it's a, at, Yeah, go ahead. Ask yeah. Self, what did they do with the million billions uh, reincarnation that they have done? Whatever I've been doing all that time. Yeah, what you're doing now. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is, the, this is the joke I tell myself all the time whenever I feel drawn to something I know will not have long-term benefit. And I say, you've done that from beginningless time, and it has not yet led to your awakening. Try something different. <laughs> you know? We've done every career. We've probably done every religion. We've probably had every kind of relationship, had every amount of children. We've done everything so many times. Sometimes if you, I don't know, if you read a book or, or watch a movie that is somehow completely different to your life, but part of you has a, like, a memory or like a recognition of, I know that life, I know that framework, even though it's not mine and it's not now. And you sometimes have that feeling like, yeah, I think I've done that before. Uh, it just looked different. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I've done that before. It just looked different. You know, we're just going through the same patterns again and again. So, uh, you know, really, the spiritual path is just try something different. Because what we've done so far has just led to more of the same. It's confronting because we're like, well, what else? What if that doesn't work? It's like, well, try. Well, you know, life's an experiment. Um, all of it is fuel for path, fuel for practice. If it doesn't work, that's a useful knowledge that you can bring to your ability to benefit others. What does it feel like to try and fail? What does it feel like to experiment and be disappointed? All of that is useful, just as much as, you know, success, progress, transformation, realizations. Of course, that's useful. But failing is useful, too, in terms of just your ability to relate to others and what that's like. You know, it's all useful. Yeah. Just a last comment. Sometimes I feel in the Buddhist uh, uh, courses, especially in the Zoom, suddenly I have ADHD. I'm, I, you talk and I completely go somewhere else. And it happens more in the Buddhist. Uh, and, I, and I tell myself, come back, come back. And I, the association go wild. And I think it's so confronting. So so precious, but so confronting that the mind is, has so many, such a creativity to be somewhere else. 
when the material material is 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 uh, in front of you. Yeah, you're you're not alone. I'm guessing <laughs> you're not alone, and that feeling of I love this, and now something else is very urgent because the fact that I love this is very confronting. I don't really want to change. You know, even though I want to change, I really don't want to change. What's over there? You know, I can't practice today. I'm too tired. I can't practice today. I'm too stressed. I can't practice today. This, that, whatever. It's normal. Um, so the difference between, you know, self-compassion, gentleness, pacing, and when that's actually turned into forms of laziness, those self-knowledges are essential for the path. Even if you're not changing yet, you know, even if you're just able to identify Right now, I'm pacing myself because life is overwhelming and I can only absorb so much. And other times, I'm telling myself I can only absorb so much because actually I'm confronted and reactive and don't want to change, so I'll give myself an excuse to be distracted. Even just knowing that, even if you're not able to change yet, is vital. And it means that you have more pathways of empathy, doesn't it? Because when you see that in others, you're less annoyed with them. You know, it's more like, yep, just like me, just like you, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, this verse is a nice one. Um, and the whole kind of next sequence of verses is like that, basically a mirror to check. Are, are you living in alignment with your values? And if not, how come? You know, just really gently, how come? Yeah. Uh, other thoughts about that verse before we go Heart Sutra? Okay, Heart Sutra. Um, it's on page 57, the English. So um, the Hebrew is next to it. Um, and also I sent you a form that has the two um, languages side by side, if that's useful. Um, but basically what we're gonna do is just kind of zero in on the parts that I think are the most significant and relatable. Uh, last week we were talking about the five excellences. Some Sometimes they're framed as the four excellences. Um, the point is that um, this place and time was significant. It wasn't the only time the Buddha taught emptiness. It wasn't the only time the Buddha taught the perfection of wisdom. But this particular time was especially significant because of the coming together of many things. We'll read through it, then I'll pause. So um, I'll stop after the form is emptiness section and we'll pivot to that. So starting at the top, the heart of the perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Thus did I hear at one time. So words permitted by the Buddha, right? Not words spoken by the Buddha, but words permitted by the Buddha. The Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of vultures mountain in Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. So the Buddha was meditating on the emptiness of the aggregates. He was meditating on the perfection of wisdom. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. So this is sometimes translated as intrinsic nature. And the key word here is inherent or intrinsic, is saying this is the second turning of the wheel, this is the most subtle view of emptiness, this is the prasangika madhyamaka view. Yeah, so just, you know, intrinsic, inher lacking intrinsic or inherent existence is the most subtle view. Coarser to that is 
thinking things are empty of true existence or empty of being self-sufficient and substantially existent or being empty of being permanent, unitary, and partless. Those are all coarser views. Here we're looking at the subtlest view of emptiness from the perspective of imbuing it with bodhicitta. Right? And as I said last week, Avalokiteshvara slash Chenrezig slash the Buddha of Compassion, he is taking the aspect of being a bodhisattva in this context in order to model the dynamic that they want to continue in the future. So you have senior teacher, junior teacher, senior student, lots of people watching. That's the scene. Okay. So then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra, the senior student, so this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, the junior teacher. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? So this part through the power of Buddha is important. What mean, what's being said here is there was a blessing and an inspiration that happened that made Shariputra ask this question at this time. Now, of course, Shariputra may or may not have already realized emptiness at this time. He might have just been modeling the good debate dynamic that he wanted the other students to come in accordance with. Or it could be that he did have that question, but why he decided it to say it then at that time. And the, Buddha, the Buddha's blessing is something that sounds very religious and sounds very mystical. But what's being said when we say, I've received a blessing or something blessed my mind is basically that the conditions came together for the next shift. Something moved from an intellectual understanding to a heart understanding. Um, the definition of a blessing is that which moves the mind towards Dharma, that which moves the mind. So there's a lot of prayers requesting blessings or asking for blessings. And what you're really doing is saying to yourself, open up, open up, open up, open up. Yeah, let there be a shift from what I know and believe to who I am and what I embody. Let there be that shift from head to heart. Yeah, open up. So you're requesting blessings, which sounds like you're saying, you out there transform me in here. But what we're really saying is, me and here open up to the love and inspiration that I'm constantly being flooded with, but don't always feel. Does it make sense? A blessing. Okay, so, you know, micro moments of that or ordinary moments of that are those moments, you know, maybe in a session or with a friend where you synchronize and move together to the next stage of whatever process of development you're doing. Yeah, when you synchronize, you know, you like click in and it's moved from just, you know, a good healthy conversation that's useful into something that's profoundly transformative and you're shifting. Yeah, that kind of magic that can happen between people where you're mutually receptive and you're mutually engaging at the right way in the right time. So these conditions, some of them are the two people involved and some of them are the surrounding environment. A lot of things have to come together for things to shift. So at this time, there was one of these shifts where Shariputra was inspired to ask the important question that all the other students had as well, which is how do I practice the perfection of wisdom? Okay. So he said that in the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage, who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. So that's the short answer. And then he elaborates in the rest of the sutra. So the short answer, the highlighted answer, the pith answer, how do you practice the perfection of wisdom is that you correctly with logic, with reasoning, and repeatedly in meditation again and again, see the five aggregates as empty of inherent nature. Form, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, consciousness. See them as empty. 
again and again. Yeah. So he, you know, you see that he elaborated from, uh, I'm not just answering your questions, son of the lineage. I'm answering everybody's questions, sons and daughters of the lineage, everybody. This is how we should practice. And to say of the lineage means of the bodhisattva disposition. So people that don't want to just cut the root of samsara for the sake of nirvana, but people that want to cut the root of samsara in order to progress to full enlightenment Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. So the Mahayana lineage is what's being spoken here. So then here we go. He gave the short answer and now he elaborates, like let's start with form, let's start with matter. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. Establish that about form, the very thing we identify the most with at our level. We think of our body and our physicality, our ethnicity, our gender, everything. We think of things related to form, our race, as us. Start with the course, start with the obvious, get your head around that and then move on to seeing that in the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty, okay? So we start with form, and to say form is empty is to say that form is empty of inherent existence, right? So you just sit with, all right, it's a word, it's a phrase I've heard a lot, it's empty of inherent existence. What does that mean in relation to form specifically? Okay, so then you unpack it, with either causes and conditions, parts, or basis of designation. But you use form, right? Use your form. It could be any form, but use your physical form aggregate and think, all right, what are the causes and conditions of the body that mean that it's not self-creating? Mother, father, genetic material, right? Those are causes and conditions, right? So you think, all right, so this thing I, I think of as mine and me came from two other people who came from two other people who came from two other people who came from two other people. I think it's mine, but it didn't come from me. I didn't make this form. I didn't, you know, have a little mind and then I got some clay and I made a little body and then I entered into it. I didn't make this form. Why do I think of it as me? You know, it's like you don't think your car is you you know, after you're about 15 or 16, right? Once you're grown up, you don't think your car is you. So it's, it's interesting to really sit with how much we think of the body as the self. And what are the problems with that? And so, you know, you just sit with, all right, if uh, an American policeman were to think that the form and the race that I am is dependently risen based on two other people, what I think of as my race, my nationality, and its importance is dependently arisen based on causes and conditions. And the whole fact of identifying as form is merely labeled by the mind, then it doesn't make any sense to project that on other people. And then if I see someone who I've othered, I know that it's not self-existent other then I can't hurt them. But if they're other, I can, right? That's the essence of prejudice, right? As soon as you other people, then you can harm people. If they are the same as you, it's like viscerally, physiologically, mentally, it becomes almost impossible to hurt people that you have strong affinity for, that you think of as similar to you. But as soon as you think other, easy. Generally, when you're making broad generalizations like prejudice, of course, in your own family, you know, we annoy ourselves and we annoy others and we fight with each other who we think of as same. But it's, it's interesting to think of the role of grasping at inherently existent form in things like prejudice. Because if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have prejudice. It wouldn't make any sense. Do you see the relationship? It seems self-evident, but, you know, everything to do with form for us is a point of conflict for us because we identify with all these facts of form. You know, as soon as you land on a solid identity, then everything that is not that identity is a threat. 
You know, you think I am woman, now all men are scary. I am, you know, white, therefore I can't be around black. You know, it's, it becomes so basic, so obvious, things you've always known. And yet, when you have that moment of anxiety in response to a stranger, what is your anxiety response to a stranger built on? It's built on, a, you know, a lifetime of assumptions the core of which was grasping at inherently existent form. You know? So we know this, we're, we're good progressive people, we have excellent politics, we're all very um, enlightened and educated, and yet if we don't acknowledge our own inner racism, then we are still part of the problem, we're just more polite about it. Yeah? So just because we have polite, socially acceptable forms of whatever kind of ism doesn't mean that we're off the hook, doesn't mean that we're not perpetuating the cycle of violence. So if you're asking yourself when you read the paper or you're watching the news, what can I do? Say, well, what can I stop doing? How about that first? What can I stop doing? Am I stopping doing that? You know, who have I decided is okay to write off? You know? So I know these things are obvious and basic to you guys, but to immediately marry it to this whole concept of what is being discussed in the Heart Sutra, it becomes a little bit more personal. Yeah, and to really look at why is there the feeling of threat? When we feel a threat, especially from strangers, what is the core of that in terms of how you identify and how you identify them? So you can look at the fact that all form is empty of inherent existence, form is empty. And then you could sort of feel like now you're above it all. Yeah, like now I see everything is empty. I'm free of all prejudice, I'm magic. And then you remember emptiness is form, which is talking about dependent arising, right? So it's not like emptiness negates form. That's the easy trap to fall into, is to think, oh, all form is empty of inherent existence. Therefore, there are no forms there. Therefore, there's no way to have prejudice. There's no way to have blockages. There's no way to be prejudiced in any way, because I know better. But emptiness is form. Yeah. So form is empty, okay. Yeah, we sort of can be smart about that. But emptiness is form is more difficult, because you're saying that things dependently arise and they do have an appearance. And the fact that they have an appearance doesn't mean that they exist from that appearance or as that appearance, but they do have that appearance. So we can't pretend not to see an illusion. We just need to see that it's illusory. Does that make sense? So form is empty, emptiness is form. While it is empty, it is existing. That's what we need to hear there. While it is empty, it exists. Emptiness is never related to something kind of without, without object. It's always tied to a conventionality. So then we say emptiness is not other than form and form is not other than emptiness. This is talking about the middle way view between nihilism and eternalism. Yeah, so to say emptiness is not other than form, you just kind of sit with that. What does that mean? Emptiness is not other than form. That means there is no emptiness divorced from its referent. Form is not other than emptiness. There is only form because there is emptiness. Do you see? So then, you know, so then you really sit with, all right, form, causes and conditions, I'm clear on, I know biology, Okay, parts, what are the parts of the body? And then where are the parts of the body identify as self? And, you know, or where do I think the self is living in the body or carrying the body or surrounding the body or driving the body? And you just try to find the self that seems like it either is body or owns body. What is the self that seems like it is body or owns body? Where does it live? What is it doing? Yeah, and you look at the different parts and you think, all right, I'm not my shoulders, I'm not my ears, I'm not my nose, I'm not my this, I'm not my that. What is left? 
there is something left. Are those things there? Yes, they are there, but identity is lifted, which means othering is challenged, which means fear is gone. Yeah, and that's the essential point in our daily life. If fear is gone, then we're really doing well. So how, how is that sitting? If someone were to ask you, what's the famous phrase mean? Do you have some things you could say or is it still kind of abstract? I would like you to explain again two things. One is you said there is foam because there is emptiness, if you can explain that. And then if you can also explain how you go to the idea that fear is gone. Form exists because there is emptiness is um, the analogy they usually give is that movement is possible because there is space. Okay, so it's, it's not a perfect parallel, but just, you know, just kind of think about not outer space, but like space in the room. The fact that my hands can wave around is allowed by the space. There could be no movement of hands unless there was space to allow for that movement. So similarly, there is no form unless there is emptiness, right? Things arise from emptiness. Things arrive, arise because of being empty, meaning that they don't self-create. It immediately ties you into an, a knowledge of kind of cause and effect, right? It starts to help you understand the way in which Karma does not negate emptiness, and emptiness does not negate karma. Um, and that they have to live together in the same place at the same time. So you can only say that the cup is empty of inherent existence if you have an idea of cup. Yeah, so you can't just say there's nothing, 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 nothing. We're, we are still having a relationship with the relative world. And to say that then knowing that means you have no fear. If you're not identified with what has arisen within the space of emptiness, then you're realizing that everything has arisen within the space of emptiness. Everything has an interconnected relationship. And so to be afraid of one piece or the other is like your left hand being afraid of your right hand. Of course they could hurt each other, but how ridiculous, you know, because it's part of a system. But it's not saying the left hand is the right hand, but they're completely connected. So harming one doesn't make sense to harm the other. It just doesn't make sense. So, so why would you say the two hands are afraid of each other? And if even one of them is losing its fear, doesn't that have a relationship on the system? You know, if you're coming into a situation where there is a natural societal prejudice, but one person is not armed, <laughs> <laughs> internally, armed externally, if one person comes in without weapons, doesn't it immediately diffuse the potential for violence in the situation? If both people have guns, it's going to be a fight. Yeah. So, you know, it's not to say that we pretend that we don't have prejudice anymore. It's, it's about recognizing where our prejudices come from consciously with a great sense of responsibility that if we never acknowledge our own prejudices, we're still part of the problem, even though we're polite, even though we're nonviolent, even though we're nice people, we are still part of the problem because we're shoring up a whole system that allows for harm of the other, right? And so the more we embody that knowledge, the more it's able to echo out and you know, reverberate around society. I, I think I asked it so many times, but it's still not clear to me the difference or the similarity between uh, potentiality and emptiness. In emptiness, we negate uh, the uh, inherent existence. And is it the same? Is, it some, is emptiness bigger than pot potentiality or it's... It's like emptiness is the reason for potentiality. And why is emptiness more than pot potentiality, why isn't it synonym as of? It's not like it's bigger, it's, it's that it's the reason, yeah? Things have potential because they're empty. If they weren't empty, if they were independent, and if they were permanent, and if they were one, 
then there could be no transformation because everything would be established, finished. It would be itself. Yeah. And it, more than it just being itself, everything would be obvious and there would be um, like unanimous agreements about opinions and nothing could ever change. You know, so because things are empty, there can be transformation. If they weren't empty, they couldn't be. So always remember that empty is because dependent arising. So what is the dependent arising if not a sea of possibilities? So it's a relative truth, ultimate truth question. Yeah, and so relative truth does not negate ultimate truth. Ultimate truth negates the deceptive appearance of relative truth, but not the fact that we have that deception and have to live in that deception. Is potentiality relative truth? Depends on what kind of potentiality you're talking about. Yeah, so the fact that the mind is empty of inherent existence is your naturally abiding Buddha nature, which you've always had from beginningless time. But there's also the fact that the mind needs to be developed, which is its you know, developmental lineage. So there's lots of kinds of potentiality. But the fact of its emptiness is one type, and it, they've always gone together. What do you think is at the core of the question? What's the worry? It's not a worry at all, because in self-psychology, we emphasize the potentiality, the transformation. And it's, it's like similar languages. It's not quite the same. It's easier for me to understand the transformative language. And it's more difficult to grasp the um, emptiness language. This is why I'm, I'm asking. Sure. Yeah, no, and emptiness is a, a non-affirming negation. It's not implying anything in its place, but like space, it allows for things. You know, I thought today that maybe we would um, try the meditation together that goes with the Heart Sutra, and, um, and then I'll send it to you to repeat for your Wednesday meditation. And we'll, we'll go through the whole Heart Sutra. I'm not going to skip any bits, but today I thought we would just kind of sit with the initial premise um, and not overload you because the initial premise is something really important to get clear on. And I think, you know, when we do the meditation on the Heart Sutra, there's a lot of different ways that we can do it. But um, to do it kind of helps clear obstacles and it helps shift out of over identification of whatever it is that we're holding on to tightly enough to be afraid of something else. So there's a lot of, you know, pressure, anxiety, stress, tension in the world right now. And I think that um, if we can bring an awareness of emptiness to that, um, as well as um, bring an awareness of bodhicitta to that, we might do some good. So I thought that maybe the first time we do this meditation, we do it all together so that you can ask questions and then I'll send you the recording of it so you can do it at your own time. So this meditation is, in, is towards the back of your book and you don't need to look at it. Um, it's probably easier if you don't but it basically gets plugged into the section of the Heart Sutra where there's the mantra. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep reading until we get to the mantra, and then we'll pause and go into the meditation that goes with it. Okay, so the sutra continues, and just kind of sit with what your understanding is so far. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. 
There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. So then we shift to the meditation. And you start by visualizing that Shakyamuni Buddha is in this space in front of you. And at his heart is Prajnaparamita. Okay, so you start with Shakyamuni Buddha. At his heart is Prajnaparamita. So she's the essence of the perfection of wisdom. So she's got four arms um, and basically is the embodiment of ultimate truth and the knowledge of ultimate truth from the Bodhisattva perspective. And so then at her heart is the mantra. So it's like these three circles or three sets of beings. And you don't have to be able to visualize it perfectly. You're just trying to have a mental impression of there's the teacher Shakyamuni Buddha there, the one that we relate to as our teacher. And then there's the deeper form, which is the mother of wisdom. And she takes this shape, yellow, holding a text, etc., at his heart. At her heart is the, is the mantra. And the essence of the mantra is the five paths. Right? That's what all of this refers to. It means basically it is thus. To become a Buddha, you have to go, go, go beyond, go completely beyond, awaken, so be it. But it really means the five paths. The path of accumulation, preparation, seeing, meditation, and no more learning. That's the essence of it. So you just take a minute and imagine these three sets. Buddha, then Prajnaparamita, then the mantra at her heart. And then imagine from that mantra at her heart, rays of light go in all directions, filling you, filling all sentient beings, ripening your awareness of emptiness. So just light going out, stimulating the minds of others, blessing the minds of others, helping them to understand ultimate truth imbued with bodhicitta. So you just try to hold that impression and then we do the mantra together. And when we recite it, we can skip the om. And it goes, Taya ta gate gate Aragate, Arasamgate, Bodhisoha, Tayata, Gate, Gate, Aragate, Arasamgate, Bodhisoha. Jayata Gate Gate Arai Gate Arasam Gate Bodhisoha Jayata Gate Gate Arai Gate Arasam gate bodhisattva. 
Sayata Gate Gate Ara Gate Ara Sam Gate Body So And then continue it under your breath, holding the idea of radiating light going out, bringing wisdom to yourself and others. Tayata om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisawa tayata om gate gate tayata om gate Tayata om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. The mantra absorbs into prajnaparamita. who absorbs into Shakyamuni Buddha, who dissolves into light and absorbs into you. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Aryo Abhukhiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagas rejoice. The Bhagawan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivadi Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Abhukhiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of humans, gods, asuras, and gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. So um, the simplified version of that meditation is um, towards the back of your book, if you're curious. But um, um, do you have any thoughts or questions? If you wanted to lead yourself through it, do you feel like you know the basics? It's quite a simple one, but it's, it's very direct. All right, so um, I thought I'd just highlight a few other pieces that are a bit easier for us, um, just so that they get covered. And um, then on um, a fresh day, we'll start with something a bit um, harder. So um, if you go back to um, the top of the page, page 58, where it says, there is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. If you want to write a little note that says this is referring to the 12 links of dependent arising. So if it's referring to the 12 links of dependent arising, anywhere you see there's no this, there's no this, there's no this, there's no this, it's a short way of saying there's no inherently existent this. Yeah, because back at the beginning it said correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature that empty of inherent nature has to be pulled through the whole rest of the sutra. So don't think that everything's been being negated in complete nothingness, saying no inherently existent, 12 links of dependent arising in this case. So when you say there is no ignorance, it means that there is no self arisen ignorance out of nowhere causelessly. There is no extinction of ignorance out of nowhere causelessly right? So on and up into including no aging and death, the 12 links, you know, right? The 12th of the 12 links, aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. So you could pause here and do a whole meditation on each of the 12 links of dependent arising one by one, and think about how each one of them lacks inherent existence. Yeah. And then, you know, and then you go on and think, 
Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path that's referring to the Four Noble Truths. So the whole sutra is like a recipe for preventing fundamentalism because it's talking about all of our main beliefs, isn't it? All of our core issues, all of our core beliefs are embodied within this sutra. And then it's saying none of them exist from their own side. Yeah, so name them and negate them. Name them and negate them. They're there, they're functional, they're useful, they're good frameworks, and none of them exist from their own side. So um, anyway, sitting with that, and uh, we'll come back to it on Wednesday. So just take a minute and dedicate the merit. All of the energy we put into these thoughts go towards realizing emptiness in order to realize fully the nature of the mind, cutting the root of samsara, developing into complete enlightenment.